morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you guys are here. Just want to clarify one thing really quick before we jump in is that uh, you heard from Pastor Amy about reset nights. We're so excited for that. And then you heard it from Brooks up there, but there was two separate times that you were given. So I just want to clarify real quick. 6.30 is the times for reset night. You are not going to want to miss it. We've got some incredible speakers coming here, and we are really praying that God is going to do something incredible in our church, in our community, so make sure that you're a part of it. So, um, hey, can we just welcome those who are joining us online? Let them know that we're thankful for them. <laughs> welcome them. Glad they're a part of our church. As Pastor Amy said, a lot of us staff were down in Birmingham, Alabama, Church of the Highlands, for the Grow Leader Conference, and man, it was an incredible time. Um, I learned a lot while I was there, had a lot of fun with our staff members, and uh, you know, I'm just so thankful uh, for Pastor Matthew, and that he's never satisfied. He is continually wanting to learn and grow himself, and he's continually pushing us as staff members to grow, and I think that just honestly shows uh, humility on his part, that he's always wanting to grow. He's always wanting to learn. So would you guys just uh, help me in honoring Pastor Matthew? We're thankful for him. Come on, River Church. If you love your pastor, let him hear it. Just so thankful for him. So today we're going to wrap up our summer at the River Series. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm glad that we're wrapping it up. Not because that it's been a, a, a bad series. I think it's been great. But so that means summer's almost over, and I'm so ready for my kids to go back to school. Are there any other parents in the house who are ready for school to start? Get them kids out of my house. Come on. Come on. We need it. It needs to get here so fast. Counting down the days. Come on. So, hey, but we're in this series, and it's something that you guys have asked for. Every topic that we've talked about is something that you asked for in our, uh, in our Easter surveys. And so today we're going to uh, wrestle with the topic of forgiveness. And every single year we do this uh, series, what you ask for, what would you like us to teach about. Uh, every year, forgiveness seems to be one of the top answers. And so I think today I'm gonna, uh, we're going to unpack it. And it makes sense because forgiveness is something that we continually have to do in our lives, right? Like we're not perfect people. Uh, we work with people who aren't perfect. We live with people who aren't perfect. So this thing of forgiveness keeps coming up. So today I'm going to ask you to tap into an emotion and a statement that we probably all have said about a person or a situation that's caused us pain, and that is, I don't care anymore. I just don't care. I used to care, but not anymore. That thing used to bother me, but it doesn't bother me anymore. And the fact that we have to remind ourselves over and over and over that we don't care about it means that we actually do care about it. This is just a lie that we use to try to convince ourselves uh, to, so that we can ease the pain or the frustration or the tension of a situation or a relationship, but it simply doesn't work. And I know that it doesn't work because, like I said, every year this topic of forgiveness is something that you ask for, you want to hear about it. So forgiveness is just one of these subjects, um, but I want us to know that God has a better way for us than to simply say, I don't care anymore. And I think we all deal with this. Uh, we probably have had a relationship or something where we deal with this. You know, I say this phrase every fall, uh, about three weeks into the college football series when I'm tired of watching IU play something that resembles football. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, and like I, I always... I always say, I don't care. It's, I, I'm over it. I just, I can't deal with them anymore. But then at night I think, okay, if we had a different coach, <laughs> quarterback, running back, tight end, wide receiver, offensive line, defensive line, linebacker group, cornerbacks, but the kicker, he's good. We'll keep him. If we could just fix those nine areas, we could have a good team. And maybe we could go to a bowl. Maybe, maybe. You know, I look at the schedule and I think, win, win, loss, loss. Oh, we got to get this one out. So I say that I don't care, but I really do, and I think that's for all of us. And I'm just going to let you know that this is a challenging message, okay, and that you're going to push back on some stuff that I'm going to say, and it's okay. But I need to explain one thing to you about God and how he works in order for you to get past that pushback. And that is, you know, sometimes when we hear the things that God says, hey, do it this way, do it my way, our first thought is, no, 
It's just not that easy. However, there's a little thing and a one word that we have to grasp hold of, and that word is faith. See, faith is the step that we take into something that makes absolutely no sense, only to discover that on the other side of it, there was a miracle that took place. I think Pastor Sam and Pastor Amy talked about elements of faith in their messages, so I would encourage you to go back if you weren't here, even if you were, just to re-listen to those, because faith is such an integral part of our relationship with God. And so today, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith into what seems illogical. But I think that you'll discover that when you get there, God's way actually works. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a list of steps that we often take to get to this point of saying, I don't care anymore. Okay? And when we go through them, you're going to be like, yep, 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 yep. Already knew it, already knew it. You're not teaching me anything new. All right? But then at the end... We're going to talk about something that maybe we haven't thought of before. So how do we get to this point of I don't care anymore? Well, the first thing is there's a distance. There's a separation of some type. In any conflict, whether it be between a person or countries or anything, there's a separation, a distance. And sometimes this distance is created simply by neglect. We may not put enough attention into our relationship. And then all of a sudden you realize there's this massive difference distance between you and this other person. It happens in our marriages. It happens in our relationship with our kids. It can even happen in our relationship with God where we neglect these things and then all of a sudden, whoa, I didn't realize they were that far from me. And this happens in conflict when we try to shut someone out and we think that's the best way to handle the conflict because here's the reality, we don't like tension. Is there anybody in this room that likes tension? like that friction between you. Anybody? Nope, didn't think so. So we all have different ways of dealing with it. Some of us, we like to deal with tension by sitting down and talking it out. And some of us are like, nope, nope, let's just get it over with. Let's just be friends. We'll move on. I don't want to deal with it. But there's this tension. And we do this internally. And we just say that we're done. It's over. The second thing is there's walls that we put up. Most people think that this is a solution. But really it's not. This is actually really dangerous because we can build up a wall to keep out the bad, but what eventually happens is that we build a wall to keep out the good as well. We can even wall out God. We become so protective of our heart and our emotions that we just put a wall up and that nothing and no one can ever touch us again, whether it's good or bad. And then after that is this escalation The situation becomes way bigger than it actually is. And we allow a little things to grow, and it usually involves the tongue at this point. We say something. There's a joke that says, uh, a woman will always have the last word in any argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument, right? And, uh, and, like, we can see this in our relationships, right? Like, to take something, like, really silly and simple— So my wife and I, were going to go out on a date, and we want to say, okay, like, where do you want to go out to eat? Right? I'll ask that question, and her response is, well, I don't care. You pick. Well, like, look at me. Of course, I don't care where we go out to eat. I just want to eat, right? But I know she has something in mind, even though she says, I don't care. I know that there's something. So we kind of go this back and forth. What do you want? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And then all of a sudden, this thing has escalated into something really silly. And all we need to do is decide whether we're going to have Chinese food or we're going to have Mexican food. Like, this escalated way, way out. And then we begin to think negative about the other person. And we begin to belittle them. And we don't take the high road. We find ourselves down here, and maybe the person that hurt us, we view them as up here. So we begin to say things and belittle them so that we can get over them. When we belittle someone, it gives us a false belief that we're better than them. And that's the next thing, is this false belief. And this is the most dangerous step there is, because it's in this step that the enemy gets involved. We begin to imagine things that don't even exist. We read way more into the story than is actually there, and we bring our own ideas and lies and adopt them as reality. We make up, fabricate stories in our heads about this other person, 
For me, when I've been at this point, I've made up entire conversations with somebody that I was having a disagreement about. But the conversation never happened. It was never there. See, lies are the greatest weapon the enemy has. Jesus tells us in John chapter 7 that lying is Satan's native tongue and that he is the father of all lies. He is a liar. And so what does he do when we get to this point? He comes in and he whispers things to us like, it'll never work. You never really loved them to begin with. This can't happen to you. This shouldn't have happened to you. You deserve better. And these lies cloud our judgment and our reaction. And it's a tragic place to be when we can no longer reason with the situation and we simply trust our emotions. Because the reality is, is that we can't trust our emotions. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things. And if we get to this place where we're, we have a separation, we've, we've built a wall, it's escalated, and now we have this false belief, we can't trust our emotions. We are the last people we should listen to in that situation. And finally... It leads to hostility. Now listen, hostility is not the condition between us and another person. Hostility is the condition of our soul. And it begins to affect the way we live and believe. Even when that other person isn't even around us, we still have no peace. We have no joy. And that's why I think you have asked for this topic. So, what do we do about it? You know, I gave you this list, uh, not to remind you of what you already know. Like I said, you were probably like, yes, 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 yes. Done that, done that, done that, done that. I'm right there, you know, currently. I gave you this list to point out something that we may have never really even thought about before. And that this list is the same condition that you and I were in with God before we found Christ. There was a separation between us and God. We built a wall up. Things escalated. And then we have this false belief. God doesn't love me. God doesn't know the situation I'm going through. He doesn't hear me. He doesn't see me. There's no way he can forgive me for what I've done. And then sometimes that can lead to hostility between us and God. This is the exact same condition that we were in. And so what do we do? Well, Paul tells us that we need to first off remember, right, that at one time you were separate from Christ. We need to remember this. Okay, I think he would only use this word if there was a tendency to actually forget about something. So let's take a moment and let's forget about that person who's wronged us. And let's realize and recognize that there was a time we were separate from Christ. A.K.A. there was distance between us and Christ. We were without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. See, we weren't brought near to God because we had a eureka moment or we realized that we needed to get back into church or we realized we needed to get involved in life groups, small groups, or serving. No, 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 no. We were brought near because of what Jesus did. Not because of what we've done. We were brought near even though we weren't the ones to, to start that process. Before we were even willing to accept Christ as Lord, he initiated this reconciliation process. And he wasn't even the offending party. We're the guilty ones. And yet he started the process to bring us back to him. Not only did he start the process, but he took care of it completely on the cross. And perhaps for some of us today, we have forgotten what Christ did for us. And when we remember what he did, something happens to us. For he himself is our what? Our peace. Who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier. The dividing wall of hostility. Do these words look familiar to you? When we grasp the reality of what God has done for us through Christ, we can have peace because he himself is our peace. 
And that is what I believe you're asking for. Because I think what we really want isn't help getting over a, a broken relationship with a child or fixing a marriage or, or fixing a relationship with a mom that we wanted to like us or a dad that we just wanted to hear some affirmation from. What I think you're really asking for is for the nightmares to stop, for the pain to stop, for the guilt, for the tension just to go away. We want us, we, we say we don't care anymore, but the reality is that we do. We care deeply. So when we grasp what God has done for us, he becomes our peace. So that begs the question, what does God want from us in turn? Okay, he wants us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And this is where we say, okay, that's way easier said than done, right? Have you ever read your Bible and you've ever thought, okay, God, that's beautiful, that's pretty, right, it's poetic, but ooh, I don't know if that's really going to work, okay? You don't, you, you, don't, you don't really know my situation, right? I th I've been there at times. I read something and I think, oh, mm, that's going to be really, really hard. I don't know how that's going to work out. But that's where this thing called faith comes in. We have to take that step. Paul goes on, he says that not only do we need to just get rid of these things, but then we need to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And I think the power in this verse is in the just as statement. How do we forgive people? Well, we can forgive them when we remember just as Christ forgave us. When we really grasp and take hold of what it is and what it means that God forgave us and our offenses. It, it's not only that God just forgave us, but it comes with a power, right? A power and a capacity to forgive others. Something we could never dream of doing on our own because the reality is, is that we can't do it on our own. We don't have the power to do it. That's why we keep asking for this topic year after year after year. That's why we keep trying to convince ourselves I don't care anymore. I'm over it. I don't care anymore. But there's a power that comes from God. The power of forgiveness is in just as Christ forgave you. That when he did it, he brought with it the power to do for others. So we can have peace in our lives regardless of how the other party decides to, what the other party decides to do or not do. So I'm gonna invite you to take a journey with me of three steps, and I'm gonna be honest with you, two of them you're absolutely gonna hate. I can almost guarantee it. You're gonna hate them, all right? And that's why at the beginning I asked you to take a step of faith. And I need you to filter these steps, not through your own mind, but through the authority of Scripture. And if you do that, you will discover that there is power to do what God is asking you to do. And you'll realize that God isn't asking to do it on your own. He's offering you the power to do it. So, the first step is to receive God's forgiveness. And for a lot of you, you're like, okay, great, awesome. Yep, let's move it on. Let's keep going. Got that down. Got a lunch to get to, okay? Let's keep moving, okay? But I think there's a lot of us in here, there's a lot of believers and a lot of Christians who have never really received God's forgiveness. We've prayed for his forgiveness we realize that we've done something wrong, but we're trying to earn God's forgiveness. I've been there, I've done that. And this is what happens when we try to earn God's forgiveness. When we come into church, we remind ourselves of what our week was like. Ooh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Ooh, I wasn't really kind to the person who cut me in line at Starbucks. Um, uh, and so we hold back a little bit from worship because we think we don't deserve it right, that God doesn't want us because of the things that we've done. We tell ourselves, oh, I can't go to life group this week because, ooh, I really messed up, and I was asking them to pray for me on this one issue, and I've been struggling with it, and now I'd have to confess with them that I'm not doing great, and then what would they think of me? No. That, that's what we do. We try to earn God's forgiveness, but we can't. We think about all the things we wish we wouldn't have done, but here's what we need to recognize is that God knew what we did and he knows what we're going to do in the future and he still forgives us. Is anybody glad about that this morning? 
your past, your present, your future. Everything you have ever done and ever will do has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. And we have been completely set free by the blood of Jesus. And that love changes absolutely everything for us. And this morning we really need to recognize that we'll never have to forgive anybody more than God has already forgiven us. First Timothy, even though I was once a blasphemer, this is Paul writing this, a persecutor and a violent man, before Paul met the Lord, he was in charge of going from town to town and rounding up the Christians and killing them. That's what he did. So this is who he was. He says, I was a violent man. He was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this faith that Paul's talking about, I think what he's realizing is that while he was doing all these incredibly terrible acts, while he was killing these Christians, I think Paul's realizing that God still had faith that he could use Paul to do something for his kingdom. And so for us, that means no matter what we've done, no matter our past mistakes, that God still wants to use us. Are you thankful that God wants to use you this morning? That he has a plan for your life? And I love how the scriptures are full of people who God intentionally used that have the worst backgrounds to prove his extraordinary love for you and me. It's comforting to me because, to be honest with you, I'm not a perfect person, right? And so I love reading the scriptures where God uses imperfect people. And so not only does he forgive us, but he also has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And so for some of us today, we need to do this. We need to do exactly what Isaiah says. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool, if, if you will only obey me. See, the reason we have trouble forgiving is that we've never truly grasped the forgiveness of God. If we live our lives trying to earn God's forgiveness, we will live our lives trying to make others earn our forgiveness. The second step, freely give what you have received. Now, this is where that pushback is going to start to come. All right, step one is the reason we can forgive. Now we're supposed to freely give what we have received because the forgiven forgive. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, freely you have received, now freely you must give. We didn't earn God's forgiveness, so we need to stop trying to make others earn our forgiveness. Paul tells us in Corinthians, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one, that Jesus died for all, and therefore all have died. And a physical death, no, a spiritual death. That the old person is gone, the new has come. He goes on to say, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died, and for them and was raised again. See, Christ died for our best interests. So now we must die for his best interests. We will do for others what Christ has done for us. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for others. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Christ and himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Are you glad that God doesn't count your sins against you anymore? And that he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. See our debt was worthy of a capital punishment. Eternal death and hell. But God wiped it out. He took our balance to zero. And this is the best news you will ever hear in your entire life. 
See, forgiveness is not something that we just say with our lips in our heart, but it's actually something that's reflected in the way that we treat other people. And those relationships, to be honest with you, that you're struggling with, they may never be restored, but we can do something that requires no participation from them. And is that we can take the balance they owe us and they can, we can make it a zero because that's what Jesus did for you and me. And that's where I love that old hymn that Jesus paid it all and now all to him I owe. Now we are ambassadors for Christ. We had a, John Maxwell taught a Wednesday session this last week at the Grow Conference and it was incredible and he used this passage of scripture and he said, when you become an ambassador for a country, your thoughts and your opinions are no longer valid and they no longer matter because you represent that country. And so that country's thoughts and opinions are what you have to do. And that as Christians, we must learn that. We must put off the old self. Our opinions, our thoughts are no longer valid. We must take on the image of Christ and represent that to all people. So now we walk around telling others of what Christ has done for us. And we extend that to them. And that's the secret. And I know this sounds really, really hard, but I guarantee that if you will obey God's word and you become an ambassador, that a miracle will take place in your life. And on the other side, you'll see it at work. Here's the third one. Go first. And this one is probably the hardest one of them all. This will be the most challenging thing. See, one of the most unique things that Christ did for us is that he didn't wait to see if we would accept this gift of forgiveness. He went first. It wasn't like he was on the cross, nailed to his hand, hammer in the air, and he said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 just a minute, just a minute. Before I go through with this, are there any takers out there? Well, will anybody accept forgiveness? Anybody? I don't want to do this if I don't have to, if no one's going to do it. I don't want, okay, anybody? No, he didn't do that. He went first. Romans 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, separate from God, while there was a distance between us, while we built a wall, while it escalated, while we have false beliefs about him, and while we have a hostility between us and God, he sent Jesus to die for us. And we're being called to a greater place of faith. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be children of God. Let me tell you, church, the first to forgive is the happiest. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. This word blessed in the Greek is makarius, and it means happy. And not happy joke or happy because my kids are going back to school in a few weeks but it's a happiness that is regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in and that you can be happy because God has blessed you and you are contented and fulfilled internally no matter what's going on externally and just to prove that this isn't just an isolated thing we'll go to the book of James and it says but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. I want to take a second and talk about the wisdom that comes from heaven. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, is contradictory to the wisdom of the world. And I want to say to you today that I think the wisdom of the world is what's really messing us up. It's selfishness. It's, it's all these, opposite of all these things. The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. He goes on to say, peacemakers who sow in peace are raised, raise a harvest of righteousness. Peacemakers who sow, they're the ones that go first. They're the ones that do it. And so I know that there's some of you who are gonna be sitting here today and you're gonna say, yeah, 
that's great and all, but you don't know the pain that's inside. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what did to me. That might be great for 90% of the people, but that ain't going to work for me today. And the reality is, is that I don't know your story. And if you were to tell it to me, I would probably agree with you. Yeah, that dude's a jerk. I don't like him either. Right? But the love of Christ leaves us no option today. The enormity of what he has done for us leaves us no option. So I'm not asking you to feel it. I'm asking you to do it right? I asked my daughter last night to brush her teeth before she went to bed because I knew what she had eaten, ice cream, cake. And you know what she told me? I don't feel like it. Mm. You're going to feel something in a minute if you don't get up and brush them teeth, right? I asked her to brush her teeth because I knew all the sugar that she just had and I didn't want a cavity and decay to happen in her teeth. And church, I'm asking you today, I'm telling you, don't feel it. Do it because I don't want K of bitterness and unforgiveness to take a root in your heart and in your soul. Do it. I don't think that Christ felt like going to the cross. In fact, Matthew 26, Jesus says, my father, if there's any way Get me out of this. But then he said maybe the most and the most important phrase that Jesus has ever said on our behalf. Not my will, but your will, God. Not what I want, what you want, your plan. And if we can say those same words today, not my will, God, but your will. Say those same words. There is something on the other side of it that will absolutely change our life. Now, it may not change the broken relationship or that situation in your life, but it will make you better because you will live with a different kind of peace, a peace that the scriptures say surpasses all understanding. See, this message isn't for the person that we say we don't care about anymore. This message is for us. I'm going to close with this, and we could close every single service like this. Choices lead, feelings follow. You're going to have to actually do this, right? You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to do something. Anytime that Jesus did a miracle or work in somebody's life, there was a call to action afterwards that they had to do. And that's for us today. We have to make the choice. So with every head bowed, every eye closed today, Maybe you're realizing for the first time that you need the forgiveness of God in your life. You need to accept that. He's offering it to you freely. Remember, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so today, if that's you, would you just raise your hand real quick, admitting today that you need Christ's forgiveness in your life? Yes. Keep them high, think one. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pray this prayer. I want you just to say something like it. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I recognize that I need your forgiveness in my life. So today I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe it in my heart that he died for me, that he was raised again, and then I am set free. And I surrender myself to you. Amen. Hey, River Church, would you join me in celebrating that eight people made that decision in this service? Right? Come on. Hey, come on. Come on. We had two in the last service. That's ten people. Now, here's what I'm going to do. The band is going to play a song for us, and I'm going to call you to choose to do something. You're going to have to do something. Like I said, Jesus made people take action. So on the sides over here and over here at these stations with the lights, there are pieces of paper and there are pens. And if God puts somebody on your heart today that you need to forgive, you know that you need to forgive them, you're going to go first and you're going to write their name on that piece of paper and you're going to take it to one of the crosses on the side. There are pens there and you're going to pin it to the cross. Okay? And for some of you, 
you might need to forgive yourself. Maybe God's been talking to you and you need to forgive yourself for something. So you can go ahead and write your own name on it. But you're going to take the first step and you're going to do that. Would you stand as we worship?